without an active awareness of our own inner lives, we as extroverts depend on feedback to make a decision. And our growth opportunity lies in going inward and figuring out what it is that we want and what it is that's important to us. Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're talking about extroversion and introversion. I wanted to share with you some things that I found in this book, Personality Type and Owner's Manual by Lenore Thompson. Just a little caveat, she has a chapter in there about type on your brain. This book was published in 1998, so I'm going to say take that with a bucket of salt because things are outdated and maybe supplement with Dr. Dario Nardi's neuroscience of type. Those are maybe a little newer insights. Here's what Lenore says about type theory. She says it describes human behavior, points to truths of the human condition and enlightens us about how we interact with the world. And I just thought that's a very nice way of putting it. For extroversion and introversion, she also goes into a little bit of developmental descriptions. She says that primitive introversion is basically infantile. It's literally the baby's needs. When a baby starts screaming because it's hungry, that's the introverted sense of the baby saying, hey, I'm hungry. And then developed introversion is when we recognize the universal in the personal. Similarly, for basic extroversion is an experiment of how we can affect external surroundings. It's also self-oriented and maybe a little attention seeking. And then developed extroversion looks more like consensual reality, where we realize and understand and interpret other people's version of the reality that we all live in and share. Importantly, she points out obviously that we're all using both extroversion and introversion at all times, depending on what your dominant function is. And also that E and I, E extroversion, I introversion, are biological traits. So they have this biological basis. I think I've posted this in a different video as well. For people with extroversion preferences, there is a greater need of stimulation in order to feel energized because of the way that our dopamine receptors work. So we have a higher threshold for the dopamine stimulus to kick in. And for people with introversion preferences, the neurotransmitter and the hormone that they more respond to is called acetylcholine. And that is more about the parasympathetic nervous system, which is reflecting and and relaxing. Lenore goes on to say that then in midlife, things maybe shift a little, right? According to Jung's theory of individuation as well, where the psyche seeks to gain balance. So if you have extroversion preferences, you may be moving into the introverted part of yourself and introverted functions because you start asking, what does it all mean? And then for an introvert in midlife, she says they might go towards extroversion because they found themselves and now they might be more comfortable actually sharing themselves. So now they know who they are and figured that out and there's a drive to bring that outside. Here's something that I resonated with because I'm an extrovert and I'm married to an introvert. And this might be a little cheeky, this might be a little touchy. She says, and I agree, that the E thinks maturity and normalcy is the ability to find meaning and satisfaction from an outside life. The judgment that extroverts sometimes have for introverts, the quiet thing that we sometimes think to ourselves is, ah, you should just go out more. Just those that four letter word, just, by the way, we could do a whole video on that. But the idea of wouldn't you also so, be so much happier if you just went out a little more. That's the judgment that E's who are not but very reflected have about I's. And what Lenore beautifully points out is a reminder that for extroverts, going inside is equally as stressful and unpleasant as going outside is for the introverts. She writes that the E associates their inner life and their inner self with unpleasant experiences, uncivilized tendencies and impulses. And that absolutely resonates with me. I don't know about you. Without an active awareness of our own inner lives, we as extroverts depend on feedback to make a decision. And our growth opportunity lies in going inward and figuring out what it is that we want and what it is that's important to us, how we feel about things, how we experience things, because otherwise you're just always going to be dependent on that other person. 
same for the introvert. The introvert also has to balance their introversion with with living in the outside world. But the way that she describes it is when you only see with one eye, opening the other creates conflict and disorientation at first. There is a tension at first. So for extroverts, going inward and finding out that, hey, maybe your opinions and your thoughts and needs are different to that from people outside of yourself, that creates an idea of change that would upset your current life because you'd have to start doing things differently maybe right if you're unaware of what you actually want then it's fine you can just go along and get mad every once in a while and let off some steam and that you don't have to change anything the extrovert sees inner conflict as a problem when opening your eye to your own inner world and your inner thoughts and needs and everything is the growth opportunity you can see the ambiguity as a possible different perspective and choice. Because really, if you're just looking with one eye, it's 2D, right? You need both eyes to see the perspective. So I like that description of how you have to balance your dominant extroverted function with your auxiliary introverted function. That's the development piece. For the introverts, introverts have the ability to focus at length and they have the tendency to observe and reflect and they need alone time. They're they don't rely on external input and it's their internal motives and needs that are considered primary. So they don't define themselves or their selfhood by what is outside of them, but they bring what is within them to reality. When introverts hesitate to answer, it doesn't mean that they are uncertain of themselves. It means that they're looking for a way to self-assert and to protect the integrity that they have found in their inner self. The example that Lenore gives, she has a couple of 80s and 90s references TV shows. One of them is that Captain Kirk in Star Trek is the extrovert and that Jean-Luc Picard is the introvert, if you wanted to put a name and face to the description. She says extroverts use their introversion to take care of technical details and introverts use their extroversion to supply data, which is an interesting way of looking at it. She also points out, again, I really appreciate the recognition of the cultural context because she says, especially in the United States, which skews heavily extroverted, she says ease can ignore their introverted functions because they don't have to develop it. Eyes have to develop their secondary extroverted function to realize their introverted aims and main concerns so they may look like extroverts especially in a culture that really heavily favors extroversion so those are just some examples of descriptions of extroversion and introversion that really resonated with me i think we have time to talk a little more about this other book, Type Talk, the 16 personality types that determine how we live, love and work by Otto Kruger and Janet Tussen. This is also a little on the older side. This was first published in 1988, but they give examples of what these different type preferences sound like at work, what they sound like in a marriage. Again, it was written in the 1980s, so maybe take some things with a grain of salt. For example, there's a chapter on goal setting. Extroverted managers need to do their thinking out loud, hence the goals they commit to are very much in the public domain. Introverts, on the other hand, would rather collect information about possible goals than go somewhere, sift through the data alone, gradually working towards a conclusion about what's feasible. Effective goal setting then should give extroverts the opportunity to verbalize and re-verbalize their ideas and introverts the time to reflect by themselves on what has been discussed and then ideally a compromise can be found. It's this kind of type workshop, if your company does them, that provides a non-judgmental language because there is a lot of ingrained judgment that comes with these preferences unless you're aware of them and unless you see them as equally valid ways of organizing the world and finding meaning in your life in this world. They also have chapter on dating. And what I liked here was that one introverted couple described an ideal date as a dinner for two, low lights, soft sounds, and no talking. 
The time together speaks to us and for us. They continue saying that introverts are generally attracted to extroverts because they find extroverts easy to be with simply because of their social gregariousness. Why it might work is that the introvert says extroverts are nice to have around when there is a conversation going in which nothing needs to be said. And then extroverts point out that introverts are nice to have around when you want to be alone. I thought that was cute because that's a perfect arrangement for many to be alone but still have company. They also describe a chapter about fighting rules for relationships. Extroverts talk louder and faster and know that if they can just say one more thing, the whole issue will be cleared up. They want to talk about problems now. And if they can't, they may get frustrated and panicky. And I definitely resonate with that. And then introverts who are most often as a disadvantage when a fight breaks out because they're at their best when they have time to think through, rehearse, and then have some advanced notion of the issues at hand. So they may simply withdraw inside themselves when a fight takes them by surprise. Neither fights or important conversations should only be had when you are well fed and well rested anyway, right? So stuff from five years ago doesn't get dragged up. But you also want to, if you find yourself in the middle of a heated argument, agree to take time apart and the extrovert just has to sit with the discomfort of not having it all sorted out in the moment. And the introvert gets some time away to collect their thoughts, but the introvert has to put a deadline on it and say, I'm going to come back and we are continuing to talk about this at this time. This might be 20 minutes, 30 minutes. I don't know. It depends on the volatility of the relationship and the nature of the argument. But if and when you take time away, it's important for the extrovert to know when you will continue that conversation. But yeah, taking time away to gather your thoughts is going to lead to a much more productive conversation. And I'm noticing that the video is getting a little long, but there is also a chapter on turn-ons and turn-offs. And I do want to share that with you because that's maybe how you make up then after the fight. So extroverts bring up the same two things as strong indicators that they are loved, noise and action. The noise can be in almost any form, preferably in the form of words that provide feedback, verbal lovemaking during sex, words exchanged in the midst of laughter or tears, listening to the words when they speak, saying anything nice, as long as words continue to be exchanged. And then the action also can be in various forms, keeping the um, extrovert company, all of that will go towards making the extrovert feel secure in the relationship. And then introverts know they are loved when they are allowed quiet time and space. To express I love you to the introvert is to give them space and a place to be alone, to reflect, to sort out their lives, just have quiet moments. Moreover, say the introverts, not only talk is cheap, but the constant verbalizing of what should be obvious is stressful and makes them distrustful. Why do you have to keep talking about the thing? Because that that can then lead to the introvert feeling like the demands of the relationship are too much. Introverts want space, extroverts invade space, extroverts want verbal feedback, introverts want to keep the thoughts to themselves. Failure to deliver on any of these expectations sets the stage for each to feel depressed, self-critical and unloved. And there we go. I hope you've enjoyed this slightly deeper dive into extroversion and introversion. Let me know what you think and I'll see you again soon.